one of the smaller ones in the last 20 years, the smallest in the last 20 years, because taxes are still down at the very top despite the 93 changes. But don't talk about a fat government. We have a government that is way leaner than it has been in most of the lifetimes of the people here, uh, and that's one reason people are unhappy. Now, moving along to 1993, Bob Dole, on the floor of the Senate, I was watching C-SPAN, called the 93 tax bill the biggest tax increase in the history of the universe. One of my favorite lines, I always wondered how he knew. But, you know, X-Files and all, and there could be other people out there. They're finding other planets, they might have had a bigger one. Anyway, is that right? No. It's silly. Let's go through some very basic arithmetic. Clinton's tax bill in 93 raised taxes by 3%. If that's the biggest tax increase in the history, let's say, of the country, if that's the biggest one, where did we get the other 97%? Did they sneak it in 2% at a time? No. In fact, there have been many tax increases much larger than that one, and the 93 one was mainly devoted to taking back some of the 81 tax cuts. Let's remember a little history. World War II, it was a big ticket item for the government, spent a lot of money. Taxes went up by 14.8% of the gross domestic product, which in today's terms is about a trillion dollars tax increase. Clinton's tax increase, 44 billion. Well, there's a lot of zeros there to deal with, but roughly speaking, the World War II tax increase was about 24 times bigger than Clinton's. Then there was the Korean War. That took a big tax increase, almost five times as big as Clinton's tax increase. Vietnam, the tax increase to pay for that at the end, uh, at the end of 69 was uh, three and a half times bigger than Clinton's. And then more recent history, since we're talking about Bob Dole. Bob Dole, in one of what I think is one of the best things he's ever done in office, I've always admired him since then, helped. In, 19, in 1982, Shepard threw a, a bill through Congress that raised taxes. This year, that bill will raise about $70 billion in taxes. It was a good thing. It stopped some of the excesses of 1981's tax bill in particular. But a $70 billion tax increase is bigger than Clinton's by uh, half, as, half again as big as Clinton's. So the Dole tax increase of 82, much bigger than Clinton's. And then there were other tax changes in the 80s. You look at the 83 and 84, which were adopted within a few months of each other, add those together, that's again, half again bigger than Clinton's 93 tax increase. So was Clinton's 93 increase the biggest in history? No, it wasn't even close. Just as important is who paid more. And we've done a lot of analysis in the last few weeks uh, going over what really has happened under the 93 legislation. And what we found is that because they were devoted primarily, almost exclusively, to taking back some of the 1981 tax cuts that had gone to the wealthy, that except for the 4.3% increase in the gas tax, most people in this country didn't pay a penny more in taxes. And they certainly didn't pay a penny more in income taxes. The boost in the top income tax rate from 31 up to 39.6 affected 1.1% of American families, the very best off ones. The expanded taxation of Social Security affected more people, but still only 3% of the families. You put them together, only 4.2% of the families in this country saw an income tax increase from the changes that were adopted in 93. And almost all of that tax increase was for those over $200,000. So 4.2% had a increase. Well, what else happened? They had a big expansion in the earned income tax credit that goes to families making less than $30,000 a year, which is a large portion of the families in this country. And it turns out that 19 million families got tax cuts under the 93 legislation. That's 15 percent of all the families. Far more people, in other words, got income tax cuts from the 93 changes than got income tax increases. So the biggest tax increase in history, says Bob Dole, and it cuts taxes for almost four times as many people as it raises them. Kind of a strange way to look at taxes, I'd say. 
Now, of course, there was that gasoline tax increase. We, don't have, we can't discount that. Works out to about a buck a week for middle-income people. So here was the deal. You're paying a dollar more a week in taxes, and the budget deficit's been cut in half. Seems like a reasonably good deal to me, but in any event. Now, everybody's heard the stories, and they're true, about the shift in incomes over the last two decades, away from the middle, away from the low end, and towards the rich. I think that's been a bad thing. But what's happened over the last several years? Uh, is it the same thing continuing, or is something different happening? Well, actually, the news on the inequality front is surprisingly good. Uh, if you look at the past, you see that uh, in the supply side period, when they cut taxes for the high income people, that compounded the uh, growth and in inequality that was happening in the economy as a whole. So that the incomes of the richest people went up uh, by 5% a year in real terms before taxes, but by 8% a year after taxes because their taxes were plummeting so much. So tax policy was helping promote the shift in inequality. Uh, after 1986 reformed the tax code to a significant degree, uh, things sort of stabilized. The tax code was no longer promoting inequality, but it wasn't stopping it much either. But you look at what's happened over the last four years, and you find that incomes have gone up uh, for all income groups since the recession, which is reasonably normal, before taxes. After taxes, however, incomes have gone up faster for low-income people than before, but they've gone up much slower or actually basically not at all for the highest income people because the tax changes in 93 uh, made the richest people pay more and it lowered taxes on the uh, poor people. So Clinton's tax program has made the tax system now make, this, make people's incomes more equal than they otherwise would be, which is just the opposite of what was happening during the uh, supply side period of the olden days. I think that's very good. Obviously, some people think it's very bad. That's why we hear all this talk about flat taxes and national sales taxes. Because the people that liked what happened to, to incomes in the uh, early 80s, who liked the shift away from the middle and towards the rich, would like to have a tax system that promotes that again. And that's what all this flat tax talk is about. It's about shifting the tax burden away from those with the most money and towards people in the middle and the bottom. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you cut the top tax rate from 39.6 down to 20-something, and if you exempt interest and dividends and capital gains from taxation, which is what the flat tax would do, then people who make a lot of money, say Steve Forbes, for instance, will pay very little in taxes. And when that happens, somebody has to make it up. And that somebody is people in the middle and people at the bottom. And we've done some uh, micro simulations of the Army flat tax plan. They're similar to the results that uh, others have gotten, the Treasury Department and the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, <clears throat> and what they find, and you'll see it in the tables, is that in virtually any version of the flat tax that doesn't lose zillions of dollars, even the 20% rate that Army has proposed, which costs, we think, about $50 billion a year, taxes go up by thousands of dollars a year on middle-income people, but they fall by tens of thousand dollars a year on people at the top. Then you hear these proposals for a national sales tax, which is another flat tax in effect, and the distributional consequences of those are even worse. Uh, people in the middle and the bottom pay even more in increased taxes where some of these adopted. Now, of course, some of the people that are promoting these things like to come in with a ridiculously low rate in hopes that'll make people like the plan better. Uh, some of the sales tax people have just come in at 15. The break-even point, most people think, for a national sales tax, by the way, is somewhere in the 30s. They've come in at 15, which makes it look, I suppose, more attractive. I don't know why they didn't pick five or two. It would be still more attractive uh, even so. But none of these plans adds up at these low rates. And it is clear to me, it's clear to Bob Dole, among others, that they are not going to pass another tax bill that cuts taxes by another $200 billion on top of the deficit again. So we have to look at these things in reality terms. And once you bring them down to reality and say, what does it mean to get rid of graduated rates and go to a flat rate, it's just simple arithmetic that 
the flat tax is a very bad idea for middle-income people. 